This is my bi-weekly paycheck. And this is my gross pay. It's blocked out because, well, privacy. And here are all the taxes I'm paying. There's the federal income tax, and because I live in Manhattan but work for a company that's based in New Jersey, I pay New Jersey state income tax, New York state income tax, and New York City income tax. Yeah, I know. There's also a Medicare tax, and then right here is something called the Social Security tax. It's 6.2% of my pay stub, which is then matched by my employer. The money that I'm paying into the system now is supposed to come back to me later in retirement. But for a while now, experts and politicians alike have been warning that the chances of that actually happening aren't looking so good. If in fact he continues to withhold his plan to withhold the tax on Social Security, Social Security will be bankrupt in by 2023 with no way to make up for it. Social Security faces a big mismatch between the revenues it's scheduled to take in and the uh, benefits that it's scheduled to pay out. Currently in, in 2020, we're paying more in benefits than we're receiving in revenue. A Quinnipiac poll shows that less than half of Americans actually think that Social Security will be able to pay them a benefit when they retire. More and more, young clients are asking whether or not Social Security is going to be there for them. And we don't know the answer to that question. Since 2010, Social Security's cash flow has been negative, which is just a fancy way of saying that the agency isn't collecting enough money through taxes to cover what it's paying out. But all wasn't lost. There was still this huge trust fund behind Social Security. So they started tapping the interest on that fund. But here's the thing. Starting in 2021, they'll have to dip into the trust fund itself to cover those benefit payments. And even that pool of cash has an expiration date. Trustees of the fund expect that by 2035, it won't be enough to cover full benefit payments. And thanks to COVID-19, that date may come years sooner than expected. Which has some retirees seriously worried about their future. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have it or if it stopped. I really don't know. I couldn't live off the small pension. I would drain my savings and investments within a couple of years. But experts speaking to CNBC think that lawmakers will not, under any circumstances, let the system go bust. Which begs the question, what went so brutally wrong for the 85-year-old program, and will it actually be there when you're ready to retire? U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act into law halfway through the Great Depression. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. Social Security was originally intended to just do three things. Provide benefits for retired, unemployed, and disadvantaged Americans. Over the next 40 years, the program ballooned. In 1939, amendments added child, spouse, and survivor benefits. But the real changes began in the 1950s. Benefit amounts substantially increased. Coverage under the program became close to universal, and a new disability insurance benefit was offered. 1965 was the year that Social Security got into the business of health insurance. Medicare and Medicaid provided a vital lifeline to health insurance coverage for the country's older and low-income adults. And in the 1970s, were expanded even further to include a much larger group of people, like individuals of all ages with disabilities. The last major changes came in 1983, when benefits and taxes were adjusted to help generate surpluses in the program and to build up Social Security substantial trust fund. That's the same fund that's now at risk. Now, while all these changes to the system were underway, the nine-digit social security number was fast becoming the single most important identification number in the country. It was originally meant only to log a worker's earnings over their lifetime in order to calculate their retirement benefits. But it kept being adopted by more and more government agencies and private sector companies as the identification number of choice. The IRS started using it for taxes in 1962, 
the military in 1969, and later, everything from driver's licenses to credit reporting agencies, your landlord, utility companies, and cell phone providers started using it too. So for better or worse, these nine digits have essentially become our national ID by default. And now the number is assigned when you're born and it tracks you till you die. The first monthly social security check was cashed in 1940 for a grand total of about $23. Fast forward to 2020 and the average retired worker gets around $1,500 a month from social security. Nearly 9 out of 10 people aged 65 and older receive social security benefits, and Gallup research shows that some 57% of retirees say it's a major source of income in their retirement, eclipsing by far the second and third sources, such as 401ks, IRAs, and other work-sponsored pension plans. So do I depend on social security? Absolutely, without a doubt. Cece Dominguez has been retired for 10 years, and she tells CNBC that she doesn't know what she'd do if the payment stopped. As the economy changes, with prices going up and they're continuing to go up, the money that I had was not stretching in the same way it used to. And we're talking about gasoline, food, uh, utilities, just the basics that we have to support ourselves with Social Security on a fixed income, not match that increase. Cece has been working several part-time jobs to make up for the difference between what Social Security pays her and how much her bills cost her every month. So how exactly are those monthly benefits calculated? Well, they're based on your income, the year you were born, and the age you decide to start taking money out. Wondering how the math works? Well, here's a case study. The median U.S. salary is about $52,000. We'll round down to make things easy. If you have a traditional job making $50,000, you pay 6.2% of your salary or $3,100 a year in Social Security taxes. That number is then matched by your employer. Those numbers are straightforward. Figuring out how much you'll get back when you're ready to cash out is a different story. Let's say you'll turn 62 in 2020 and your average lifetime salary was $50,000 adjusted for inflation. To determine your benefits, Social Security takes your top 35 earning years, adjusts them for inflation, adds them all together, then divides that number by 420, the number of months in 35 years. That gives you $4,166. Still with me? That number is your average indexed monthly earnings, or AIME. Simply put, it's your monthly pay for the last 35 years. But there's still some math to get through. Your benefits are determined by Ben points in an equation, almost like a tax bracket, but it's used to give you money instead. The less money you've made, the higher a percentage of your salary you'll get back. This is designed to help low-wage retirees. So let's run your monthly average from before through that Ben point equation. You get 90% of your first $960 and 32% of everything you made between $5,785 and $960. And at 50,000, we won't have to worry about that third bend. So now we have our number. You can expect a monthly social security check of $1,890 if you wait until your full retirement age. But there are two big factors that will affect how much you take home every month. One of them being cost of living adjustments or COLAs, which we've assumed will be a 2.6% pay bump social security gives retirees every year to keep up with rising prices. And secondly, if you wait a few years to claim your benefits, you can add hundreds of dollars to your monthly benefit check. You are first eligible to begin receiving your social security benefits at age 62, but you won't get the full benefit amount until the full retirement age of 66 years and eight months. Back to our hypothetical case. If you wait until 70 to collect benefits, your monthly check jumps to almost $3,000. That's over $1,000 more than you would have gotten at your full retirement age every month for the rest of your life. $1 trillion in benefits will be paid out to about 65 million people in 2020. So where does all that cash come from? Social Security is financed through a dedicated payroll tax. Like we said earlier, every working American pays 6.2% of their wages to the government on everything they earn up to $137,700. Employers match that amount, or if you're self-employed, you pay 12.4% into the Social Security Trust Fund. All of Social Security's payroll taxes and other sources of income are deposited into this fund and all the benefits and administrative expenses are paid out of this fund. 
Think of Social Security like a pay-as-you-go type program. Benefits being paid out today mainly come from payroll taxes collected from today's workers. Now, for over 30 years, Social Security was flush with cash. It took in more in payroll taxes and other income than it was paying out in benefits and expenses. And the fund didn't just sit there. By law, income to the trust fund must be invested on a daily basis. So they did just that. Income to the fund is invested in interest-bearing treasury securities, earning an average interest rate of 2.5% in 2020. Every dollar of the trust fund is invested in the United States treasury securities. They're special securities only uh, designated for the Social Security trust fund, and that actually gives them advantages over regular treasury securities. U.S. Treasury securities are considered the safest kind of asset to back any claim that you have. And so at the moment, they're held in an extremely safe, although low yielding uh, kind of investment. As of the end of 2019, the trust fund was up to almost $2.9 trillion. At the moment, the trust fund is very near its all time peak in terms of dollars. It's not, it's not near a peak in terms of how many years of benefit payments can we afford to spend out of the trust fund. But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's at a very high level at the moment. But here's the thing. Since 2010, the payroll tax hasn't been enough to cover benefit payments for the massive baby boomer generation that started to retire. In 2016, the deficit of $75 billion was covered by the interest earned on the trust fund. In 2019, interest covered almost $81 billion of benefit payments. But starting in 2021, living off the interest won't be enough because people are living longer and millions of baby boomers are retiring. Social Security will have to start to draw down from the trust fund itself to help pay for benefits. And even that fund won't last forever. Experts predict the reserves could run out by 2035, at which point Social Security would only be able to pay about 79% of promised benefits. And all the while, any chance at earning any sort of return on surplus money coming into the fund is virtually lost. The reality is today, every dollar that goes into Social Security immediately goes out the door um, to current retirees and never has a chance to earn a positive rate of return over time. And that has really negative consequences if you look over decades of not being able to invest the money that is set aside when you look at pension programs, you know, about two thirds of the assets in there are actually investment returns. And so you're stripping that opportunity away from workers. The worldwide pandemic has complicated things even further. Massive unemployment, a recession, reduced earnings and lower interest rates, thanks to the Fed, could all speed up the erosion of the fund. Data from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania estimates the funds could run out as early as 2032 and the Bipartisan Policy Center, a DC think tank, says the reserves could be depleted by 2028. This doesn't mean that Social Security will have run out of money completely, but it does mean that they'd only be able to pay out a portion of the promised benefits. The Social Security Administration declined to participate in this video. Now, what does this mean for you? And many policy experts agree that federal lawmakers are going to intervene to solve the shortfall before the agency has to resort to cutting benefits. One such plan is called the Social Security 2100 Act, which includes some tax increases while avoiding benefit cuts. And that's just one of many options that Congress has at its disposal. You can either raise taxes or you can reduce benefits. And then there's little things along um, the sides that you can do. You could increase the payroll tax rate, you could also increase the wage base that those payroll taxes are applied to. So rather than subjecting the um, only earnings below a certain taxable maximum are subject to the payroll tax, you could subject uh, earnings to a higher cap or even all earnings to the payroll tax rate. You could um, you know, just do a flat reduction in benefits. You could also increase the retirement age President-elect Joe Biden wants to expand the program, meaning bigger benefit checks to the Americans who need it most. His plan to make that happen? Higher taxes on the wealthy. He wants to apply that Social Security tax to earnings over $400,000. It is worth noting that this is a bit of a reversal for Biden, who has advocated for possible benefit cuts in the past. There's another option that involves no policy changes at all, adapting how the fund invests its money. 
Yes, there's more risk, but the rate of return on treasury securities can't compete with the kind of returns you'll see from money invested in the stock market. In 2020 so far, even amid a worldwide pandemic, the S&P 500 is still higher today than it was on January 1st. If we invested in equities now, clearly the uh, Social Security Trust Fund would be exposed to the risk that stock market prices could decline. But on the other hand, they would also enjoy the extra income that uh, occurs because of dividends from stock investments and because of capital appreciation of the shares that are held by the trust fund. But those ups and downs are very minor relative to the overwhelming need for revenues for Social Security. But the problem with this kind of change in investment strategy, some say it's too late to make a difference. If we had changed the investment portfolio back when President Clinton proposed it in the late 1990s, well, it would have made a considerable difference. Uh, now we would have had a much larger uh, trust fund, but we didn't do that. And so if we start now, when the trust fund is expected to be used up over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, it will not make much difference. If none of these things happen, an outcome that analysts tell CNBC is highly unlikely, then the Social Security Administration says all beneficiaries would get 79% of scheduled benefits. Universal Social Security has been debated for as long as Social Security has existed. The Heritage Foundation, a conservative DC think tank, put together its own universal benefit plan, one that they argue will flatten out benefits, providing more for people who are below the poverty line. One of the biggest components that we are recommending is shifting towards a universal benefit program. And so instead of providing the largest benefits to the people who already had the greatest incomes throughout their working careers um, and the lowest benefits to those who had the least incomes, it would just be one flat benefit for everybody, regardless of how much you made throughout your working career. And the benefit of this is that it would actually lift about the bottom third of people would get a higher Social Security benefit. And then over time, those who are middle and upper income would gradually shift their benefits down. But of course, it would be very gradual over time so that many decades in the future, you get to this point where you have the same benefit for everybody. And another benefit of that program, as I said, is lifting more people, the lower income earners up, but it also can make the program smaller in total size and scope. One big benefit to this kind of plan, it would actually involve a social security tax cut. We estimate that you could reduce the 12.4% tax down to 10%. The median person who makes about $60,000 per year, they could have an extra, you know, more than $4,000 per month that we're talking about here. And I think it's about an extra $900 for somebody who's making only $12,000, $20,000 a year. So this is a lot more money that goes into those workers' paychecks. However, it is important to keep in mind that while this would put extra cash in your pocket today, the onus would be on the individual to actually invest that money wisely. This plan, of course, also assumes that Social Security will still be there when you retire. But one financial planner that we spoke to says that his millennial clients just aren't holding their breath for a hypothetical like this. Instead, they're trying to plan ahead for a world in which there is no Social Security coming to them in retirement. Millennials are a generation that face more uncertainty than any other generation before them. So it's no wonder they're asking whether or not Social Security will be there for them. And while we don't have an answer as to how things will look 40 or 50 plus years down the line, we can plan around that level of uncertainty by showing them a number of scenarios as to whether or not there will be Social Security, maybe a 50% reduction in Social Security, or if the system will remain as is. Invest in you. Ready, set, grow. CNBC and Acorns.